Okay, I guess I guess, uh, I guess the, the, this session was to start at seven. So it's a few minutes after seven. I guess I can, I can start. It's okay. All right, so my name is uh, Ray O'Neill. I'm a, I'm a professor of physics uh, and astronomy at uh, Florida A&M University. Um, I'm the director of the Astroparticle and Cosmic Radiation Detector Research and Development Laboratory. Uh, and uh, I like to call it my own uh, hacker space uh, in the academic uh, arena. And um, this talk is as much uh, sharing with you a, a project I'm excited about as much as a plea for, um, uh, for involvement, for participation uh, as well. Uh, so I should say before I get started, uh, this is a this is a very special year for cosmic rays. Um, many of you may be aware that uh, this is the the hundredth anniversary year uh, of the discovery of cosmic rays by Victor Hess. Uh, Victor Hess originally discovered cosmic rays uh, from the the uh, spontaneous discharging of electroscopes uh, that were left just sitting. Uh, he decided uh, a, a bold experiment uh, near the turn of the uh, century uh, to take a balloon flight uh, with uh, electroscopes uh, and measure their rate of discharge at various altitudes. And so from that, he determined that uh, the radiation causing this discharge was definitely coming from space. Um, the history is very interesting. Uh, Robert Millikan, who's uh, responsible for determining the charge on the electron, uh, uh, had sort of uh, created a public, uh, public argument that was um, documented by the New York Times, in fact, between uh, Hess and, and Millikan about whether this radiation actually was um, uh, coming from space or whether this discharging was a property of air itself. So it's kind of an interesting, if you're interested in the history, uh, uh, you should definitely uh, look into it. Well, a hundred years of cosmic ray research has gone by. We've learned a lot about the nature of the cosmic rays, but there are some questions that um, continue to plague uh, the community and are not quite answered yet. Uh, and it's primarily the um, sources uh, of the highest energy cosmic rays. Uh, whether the highest energy cosmic rays uh, at the end of the known cosmic ray uh, spectrum are extragalactic in origin uh, or galactic in origin. Uh, the most recent data uh, seems to indicate that they are extragalactic in origin. Uh, however, there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, with regard to the actual sources uh, in terms of the astrophysical sources that uh, uh, the particles are coming from, uh, whether they're coming from active galactic nuclei, black hole uh, creation events, uh, neutron star creation events is associated with uh, supernova and other star death events, uh, and possibly exotic um, uh, events uh, associated with the decay of dark matter uh, particles, uh, which the LHC may recently, may, may uh, sooner rather than later, uh, provide us with the data for that as they have already uh, seemed to have found, uh, uh, discovered um, uh, signals that seem to point to the Higgs uh, particle. Okay, so the cosmic ray spectrum as to date. Uh, so that you can see that the cosmic ray spectrum, uh, and this is the, and I, when, I, when I talk about the cosmic ray spectrum, I'm pretty much going to limit the discussion to charged or neutral particle cosmic rays, not gamma rays, not high energy light, which of course uh, is associated with cosmic ray uh, events. Uh, and in fact, uh, gamma ray astronomy is a, a marker uh, for, uh, for, for locations in which cosmic rays may be being uh, created and accelerated uh, in astrophysical sources. But anyway, uh, the spectrum covers a broad range of um, of energies, uh, uh, more than 10 orders of, well, just about, well, yeah, more than 10 orders of magnitude, uh, the order of 10 orders of magnitude in energy uh, in electron volts. You can see that at the ankle, beyond the ankle, 
uh, the data points become few and far between, and that's because those events are extremely rare. Uh, they're extremely rare. Uh, uh, it's not clear why uh, they are rare. Uh, they may be rare because the acceleration mechanisms, the astrophysical acceleration mechanisms, sort of peter out at those energies, uh, or we're just not looking enough. Uh, we don't have enough observations to provide for um, uh, a great, a large number of statistics, and that's really what this, um, what this project uh, is really all about, is increasing the statistics. So the cosmic rays consist of protons, antiprotons, positrons, electrons, neutrinos, uh, antineutrinos, nuclei, and uh, I put a question mark on the antinuclei. Uh, there is uh, at least one experiment that was created specifically to look for anti-helium in the cosmic ray spectrum. Uh, and that experiment uh, is now uh, installed on the International Space Station. Uh, and it's uh, already uh, taken quite a bit of data. Uh, all null events so far for, uh, for anti-helium. Uh, if anti-helium were discovered in the cosmic ray spectrum or any anti-nuclei were discovered in the cosmic ray spectrum, that would completely rewrite what we think we know about the structure of the, of the cosmos. Basically, it would mean that there are anti-stars uh, because any helium that uh, originates from the space environment would have to have been created in stars. Um, it's unlikely that, that that helium would be primordial helium uh, uh, created in the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And so that would mean that there's a whole region of the universe that's the sort of antimatter, uh, and it's separated from the, the material uh, universe. Um, uh, I apologize for the anti-people and the anti-matter universe because to us, we are the anti-matter, right? So uh, anyway, Richard Feynman had a really funny joke about that. Um, uh, about how to determine whether an alien that you may be communicating with is composed of antimatter. The antimatter has the opposite um, spin angular momentum states, quantum states, and so once you communicate with the alien species and you agree on what is left and right and up and down, and they come and visit you and they come out of their spacecraft, and if they then raise their left hand to shake your hand, then don't, don't touch them. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So the, the 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 specific cosmic rays of interest uh, of this particular project are so the so-called U-heckers, the ultra high energy cosmic rays. These are the cosmic rays that exist at the very end of the energy spectrum, beyond the ankle of the spectrum. So the National Academy of Sciences, uh, in their New Worlds, New Horizons um, review which was part of the decadal survey of astrophysics, uh, have, has indicated a number of important remaining questions for cosmic rays. And uh, they pretty much are, what are they, right? Uh, in other words, are the highest energy cosmic rays, uh, are, are they actually the particles that we, we think they are, the normal subnuclear particles, or are they something else? Where do they come from? How are they accelerated to such high energies? And are they actually indirect uh, markers for dark matter? So in other words, do the particle cosmic rays at the highest energies come from the actual decay, uh, self-annihilation decay of the so-called weakly interacting um, uh, supersymmetric massive particles that the LHC should find very soon? If they don't, then actually there's a problem because they've already found the Higgs, if indeed they found the Higgs. So, uh, just to highlight the, the, uh, uh, the review by the National Academy, the origin of cosmic rays is still a mystery. Uh, the, uh, the, the features so far in the data seem to point towards an extragalactic origin. Uh, however, more precise determination of the degree of anisotropy, uh, which may be possible with improved statistics. So, the degree of anisotropy, that is that they are they're coming from some places in the sky more often than other places in the sky. Okay, so a little bit of review on propagation uh, of uh, the ultra high energy cosmic rays. So the, so the, the discovery of cosmic ray energies beyond, the, beyond a certain energy limit 
is puzzling uh, because of the uh, GZK effect. So what the GZK effect is, is that it's this effect that basically it's a negative feedback mechanism on the energy of uh, propagating cosmic rays in the universe. Uh, if a cosmic ray particle is so energetic, then due to relativity, relativistic transformation, right, in the frame of the particle, then the background light of the universe should look much more energetic, right? So the microwave background, the radio microwave visible uh, gamma ray, diffuse gamma ray, and diffuse X-ray background should seem even more energetic, transformed in, relativistically transformed in the frame of the ultra, ultra high energy particle. And therefore, the ultra high energy particle is being bombarded by these extremely high energy photons in its frame, right? And so that will um, uh, instantiate a delta, what's called a delta resonance, if the particle is a, is a, uh, a subnuclear particle like a, a proton, then the gamma rays are actually um, uh, interacting with the quarks. Uh, and so this causes a decay uh, of the particle. And so much of the energy then is lost to the decay products. And so you would not expect to measure particle cosmic rays beyond a certain energy because of this very effect. Um, now, uh, it turns out that um, you can use this effect uh, as a way to measure distances, right? Uh, so if the particles are created by sources at a certain distance, right, from the, solar si from the, uh, from the galaxy or within the galaxy from the solar system, uh, then, uh, uh, then basically uh, they can only go so far before this effect becomes before this effect becomes more probable than less, right? Okay, so uh, detection of cosmics, right? Uh, if they're energetic enough, uh, then they will be weakly, they will not be deflected very much by the galactic magnetic fields. And so they will pretty much point back to their sources. So if we can detect them and determine where they're coming from, basically detect the um, shower front, I'll talk about showers in a minute. Uh, then we're basically pointing towards the astrophysical source of the, of the cosmic rays. Um, and again, the suppression of distance source background flux by the GZK effect. So any sources that are beyond, uh, I think, 100 megaparsecs will basically, we will not be able to see at the highest uh, range of the energies because the GZK effect will have dissipated all of that energy. Which is a good thing, actually, for astronomy, for particle astronomy, because then any nearby sources will stand out like a sore thumb. Okay, so the, the main way of detecting the ultra-high energy cosmics is through the extensive air showers, where you're actually using the Earth uh, atmosphere as the part of your detector volume. Uh, and so when these uh, ultra-high energy particles interact with the atmosphere, uh, they... Uh, uh, they uh, generate a shower of secondary particles and photons, uh, and those uh, secondaries can be detected at the ground uh, by various techniques. And there are two sort of uh, uh, parts of a shower. There's the hadronic part, which is the nucleon-initiated, nuclei or nucleon-initiated, uh, and the electromagnetic, which is the gamma ray initiated. So, for instance, if you have a high energy gamma ray that enters the uh, Earth atmosphere, it will essentially generate uh, electron positron pairs and more photons, and electron positron pairs and more photons, blah, blah, blah. You get a cascading shower. Uh, however, a hadronic shower, which is initiated by a proton or a nuclear fragment like iron or oxygen uh, that hits the atmosphere, will generate other fragmented nuclear fragmentation and subatomic particle showers plus an electromagnetic component. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just skip this. Um, you, you get the point. Uh, the idea here is that one way to determine whether the shower that you are uh, seeing is electromagnetic initiated or hadronic initiated is by the, the breath the, the width of the shower. So gamma ray generated showers tend to be much narrower uh, than showers generated by uh, nuclear fragments and nuclear particles. However, once you get to the very, very high end of the spectrum, 
the, uh, uh, the, the nucleon uh, showers can also be somewhat narrow as well. So again, you need to be able to sample a large part of the shower to really determine what's going on. Okay, so the measurements, the important measurements for air showers, the energy, obviously, the spectrum, and the arrival direction, which is important for astronomy. You can't have any type of astronomy unless you can do imaging, right? And in optical astronomy, lenses do the imaging for you, right? You just bend the light to a focus and you create an image and record it on an electronic detector or film. Although I, I can't, I have any, I, are there any film cameras left? I don't know. Um, it's all electronic now, which is fine. Uh, the arrival direction, uh, and so the techniques that many of the existing uh, detection uh, projects use uh, is, um, uh, are uh, either ground-based detection in materials in which the shower particles pass through the materials, dump energy in the materials, and that generates light, and that light's detected, energy is measured, um, or uh, you look at the atmosphere for fluorescence of nitrogen, uh, light from the fluorescence of nitrogen, uh, excited by the uh, uh, shower, by the, the high energy particle uh, shower. Sort of like a particle, uh, sort of like a, a cosmic ray version, a high energy cosmic ray version of the aurora borealis. Okay, so uh, here's a... The, in the in the lower, there's a depiction of what a uh, what a shower might look like. So the so the fly's eye project, which is now decommissioned uh, out in Utah, uh, looked for had both ground-based detectors and uh, and a detector that looked at the nitrogen fluorescence. Uh, and so uh, it's important to have these two different types of detection mechanisms because uh, the different detection mechanisms suffer from different systematic errors. Uh, and so you can use one as a check uh, on the other. So the detection of the shower at the ground uh, and the view of the light, uh, the, the Cherenkov light generated in the atmosphere by the shower, uh, having the ability to do both of those is important uh, for statistics. Okay, so again, sea level scintillation or Cherenkov sampling, the, the, the pros of that technique uh, uh, it doesn't depend on the weather or diurnal cycle, the day-night. Uh, the, the, the cons, of course, is that um, it, only the shower has to be coming towards you in order for you to detect it. Uh, and the, your energy determination is model-dependent because you're only sampling a portion of the shower. So now what you've got to do is you've got to do a Monte Carlo statistical uh, simulation that takes into account all the possible particle interactions that could create uh, a shower that gives the energy sampled by uh, your detector, right? Uh, the other way to look uh, for these is air fluorescence, right? Uh, the pros for that is that it's independent of particle trajectory, right? As long as you can see the atmosphere, you should be able to see the, the light, the fluorescence light, right? However, you can't do this during the day uh, or on uh, full moon nights, uh, and it's weather dependent. Uh, and many of the, and, and again, much of the systematics for air fluorescence measurements uh, deals with the um, understanding how light actually propagates in the uh, atmosphere under different weather conditions, different atmospheric conditions. Okay. What's going on here? Ah, okay. So, uh, I wanted to share this with you because it's really cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a website, uh, called the chromoscope. Uh, and what the chromoscope allows you to do uh, is it allows you to um, view the sky uh, in the different uh, regions of the spectrum, right? And it sort of overlays, right? So you can look at the gamma ray, right? You can see most of the gamma ray sources as determined by the egret experiment on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory uh, and X-ray by ROSAT visible by Hubble, uh, the hydrogen uh, uh, and near-infrared by uh, Sertif and Spitzer, uh, and the far-infrared and the microwave by uh, Kobe and WMAP and the radio, right? So this is really nice, but what's missing from this is the cosmic ray map, right? Uh, there's no cosmic ray map uh, well-developed enough uh, 
well developed enough to add to this data set. And so that's what uh, I would like to contribute to uh, with um, uh, this project. Okay, so here's the existing map of the ultra high energy cosmic rays uh, from the OJ experiment uh, located in South America. So you can see the blue part uh, is their sort of region of the sky that they can see. So, so they can't see what's in white, right? Which is an automatic bias, right, to their data. Um, and then the, 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 the shading, the blue shading, uh, tells you where they're most sensitive to, right? So they're really, they're a very sensitive area of determining the source locations of the astrophysical sources of cosmic, of the ultra high energy cosmics, is somewhat narrow. And now the circles, the black circles is basically there, are their calculated source locations so far. The red uh, crosses are the, is the catalog of sources, of gamma ray sources uh, from various other catalogs. Uh, and so there's some indication that for some of these, in some of these cases, uh, the cosmic rays are coming from the, from the gamma ray sources, but not always, right? And with a high degree of uncertainty. Okay, so obviously full sky exposure is necessary. So uh, you can do that in two ways. You can either observe events from orbit, uh, and there have been uh, uh, projects um, uh, under consideration for doing that. In other words, you're actually looking at the atmosphere from orbit and then looking at the fluorescence, uh, air fluorescence from cosmic events from orbit. Or extending existing ground-based experiments, uh, such as OJ, will need to have an, a north version of OJ. Right now it's in South America only. A north version would give it uh, a uh, full sky uh, view, but then, you know, funding is always um, iffy. Right? And the, and the uh, National Academy and the Decadal Survey did not recommend uh, the f funding of OJ North. So that doesn't necessarily mean that OJ North is not going to happen, but they are not going to recommend to the President of the United States that uh, it be a, uh, a science priority. All right, so to increase detection coverage, improve statistics, right? So for the flux of the uh, cosmic rays of energy that are uh, higher in energy than 10 to the 15 electron volts, uh, your uh, event rate uh, is about 2 pi times 10 to the minus 5 square meters per second. It's pretty low, right? And for the flux rate for the ultra high energy cosmic rays of 10 to the 17 electron volts or more, uh, is even less, uh, five orders of magnitude less at 10 to the minus 10 meters squared uh, per meter squared second. So now, in order to, if you wanted to build a detector large enough, a ground-based detector large enough, in order to increase your detection statistics to a few events uh, per second, you'd need a detector of area 10 to the 10 meters square, which is not that bad. It's actually less than half the land area of the Earth. Okay? <laughs> so, so that's, that's a, a, so a, a, it's not totally cloudy, but clearly exposure is a challenge, right? Okay, so uh, what, could, what can you do, right? Well, you could, you could try to increase exposure by deploying uh, relatively inexpensive detectors, right? So um, there were a number of projects, uh, in fact, in your own backyard here in New York, uh, at the, started out of the Brookhaven National Laboratory, which I collaborated with, um, the Mariachi project, the uh, mixed apparatus for radar investigation of atmospheric cosmic rays of high ionization, uh, the uh, WALTA project, the Washington Large Telescope Array, uh, and the NALTA, the North American Large Telescope Array, etc., have all been sort of vertically integrated um, STEM education efforts to um, do both cosmic ray astronomy and promote STEM education. Uh, at the K through 12 uh, and the community college level. Um, uh, however, uh, I kind of feel like we can do better than that, right? It, it may be, I think the technology is sort of, um, is at the point where you should be able to walk into a store and not only buy a optical telescope, but also a particle telescope, 
It doesn't seem any reason to me why you shouldn't be able to do that. So if you're going to do that, how, how are you going to do that? All right. So the first thing is you use the internet itself as the detector network, right? So the network is the detector, all right? Uh, so here's a map of the inner density of the internet, right? Uh, you guys are much more familiar with this than I am. Um, so if you can imagine um, detector, if a detector had a, was wirelessly uh, Ethernet addressable uh, and could stream its data uh, to the network, then that data would just be available, right, for anybody who is interested uh, in detecting it. And individuals who are, who are interested in operating uh, one or more uh, particle telescopes uh, could provide that data uh, to the network as well, as well as do their own observations, as well as coordinate uh, with other people uh, across the internet to coordinate their observations as well. Okay, so what will be the requirements for, for doing something like this? So, uh, if it's ground-based, you're pretty much talking about detecting a, a ground-based box, right, the cosmic cube, uh, that detects uh, showers of cosmic rays primarily via scintillation, you should be able to measure the energy, the width, the time width of the shower front, uh, and determine the shower zenith angle to a few degrees, and determine the time of the event, and it should be easy to use, right? You should not have to be, a, uh, you should not have to be uh, Victor Hess or Albert Einstein to, um, uh, to use this. Okay, so this was a project uh, out of my lab uh, at Florida A&M University. The, the the principal people are myself uh, and Michael P. Frank, uh, who's the research engineer and technical lead uh, on this. And I had a number of students uh, who've come through the lab and, and worked on this uh, from time to time. Uh, and I, I kind of think of my lab as a hackerspace because um, I give my students quite a bit of freedom to work on things that they're interested in as long as there's some dovetailing with my interests. So I'm extremely flexible in allowing that. Um, Jacob Billings, who was a biochemical engineer, and you might think, why is a biochemical engineer working in an in a astroparticle physics laboratory? So he basically worked on a, uh, developing a device that used uh, biological materials to detect uh, light from particle radiation events. Uh, and he's in graduate school now at, at Emory. All right, so the, so the Cosmic Eye project, which was a wireless sensor network for exploration of cosmic rays, of high energy uh, cosmic ray air showers, the idea for the deployment was to have four uh, detectors, scintillation detectors, uh, all sort of uh, sending their information to a central timing unit uh, that would determine coincidences between the four detectors and determine the time of the uh, shower event and send that information to a, a central PC. Uh, and <clears throat> the idea originally was to use a optical syncing, an optical syncing mechanism so that all the clocks, all the timing clocks on each of the detectors would be uh, synced by a line of sight optical. Um, again, this was, this started in my lab as part of a collaboration with Helio Takai uh, who's the PI of the Mariachi project, uh, now primarily at Stony Brook uh, in the Nuclear Science Laboratory, but it started at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. Helio Takai is a staff physicist at Brookhaven. Um, he actually uh, is on the ATLAS, the LHC ATLAS uh, uh, detector um, team. Okay, so a node, a particular node, you've got the shower, particles that uh, interact with the scintillator. The scintillator light is then detected by a PMT. Uh, the PMT then gets its pulses digitized by an FPGA-based uh, time-to-digital converter. Uh, and then that uh, data is sent wirelessly to the network or a central PC or, or really any device that can accept the, uh, the data and provide it to the network or uh, the, the, the detector itself uh, electronics can just send the, uh, make the data available to any, to the network via 802.11 standard, any device that wants to, uh, to take a look at it. I'm sorry, say that again, I can't hear you. Photomultiplier tube. 
I'm sorry, yeah, so PMT means photomultiplier tube. So a photomultiplier tube is basically an amplifier for very, very small light signals. Light uh, enters the front of the PMT, uh, ejects electrons from a material called a photocathode, and then uh, those electrons hit an electrode, and then that electrode uh, uh, spits out more electrons. Those electrons hit another electrode, and so on and so forth. You get a cascade until you get a measurable pulse out the back of the PMT. Okay, so the wireless module that we looked at uh, for providing the wireless connectivity was the Easy Urio uh, wireless module. Uh, in, in academic projects, the funding the, 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 proposal, the proposal cycle and then the funding or not funding cycle is so long that by the time you actually get funded, the, the technology you propose to use is probably already obsolete, right? So there's probably much better wireless technologies that should be used for this now, right? So if we do this again, unfortunately, NSF did not renew our funding. Um, so we're looking elsewhere. Uh, uh, we probably should look at uh, a, uh, a, what is now considered really, really good state-of-the-art, um, but cheap uh, wireless modules. Um, so the important thing for the science, right, is the pulse shape reconstruction. So in the shape of the pulse, it turns out that different particles interact differently with the scintillation material, right? And so the shape of the pulse will tell you something about the type of particle that interacted with the... Uh, uh, with the scintillator uh, material. And so it's important that the electronics be able to uh, provide uh, a pulse shape reconstruction mechanism. That can be done offline after you pull the, um, after you pull the data off. Uh, or it can be done on, in the hardware, right? On the FPGA-based front-end digitization. Well, let's see, FEDA means front-end uh, digital acquisition module. Yeah, okay. That's what my engineers told me to say. Okay, yeah. All right. Everybody is familiar with what an FPGA is. You guys should be more familiar than I am with FPGAs. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the digital front end for this is is a new is somewhat new because the traditional way of det of processing uh, nuclear pulse data, right, from nuclear detectors and radiation detectors in general is to have an analog front end that then gets digitized through uh, A to D converters and then you can do offline analysis on your computer uh, after you've uh, taken the digital data uh, off. But the, the nice thing about doing this in a fully digital implementation on FPGA is you can do everything on the board and the front end. You can provide some analysis and even some filtering of events right there on the front end. Uh, and so that, that provides some flexibility uh, of, uh, of observation uh, in terms of the kinds of cosmic ray events you might want to look for. Uh, okay, so we, we um, presented a, uh, a poster on the board uh, that we developed uh, with Brookhaven for this. Uh, and uh, the board, uh, basically the, so yeah, I'll just use a cursor here. So basically here are the signal inputs all right, here's the FPGA chip, which is shown with thermal paste. Uh, we sort of borrowed a uh, technique from the uh, gaming community, right? We wanted to run the FPGA faster than it really should be run. Uh, so we overclocked it, right? But we had to cool it, right? Because it gets hot. And again, that's because proposal cycle funding. Uh, there are much better FPGAs that exist now. If we redesign the board with a Current FPGA, we probably wouldn't have this problem. Uh, the FPGA that this was based on was the Stratix 2, uh, which is the Altera Stratix 2, which we got for free from Altera, so that's why we used it. Uh, so big ups to Altera. Uh, they're not going to give us any more for free, but that's, <laughs> yeah, we got one, so. Uh, okay, Hello, so this, this is, is Michael Frank. Ah, stop, stop. <laughs> We are okay. currently wow. doing a test and we are wow. doing of an experiment in digitizer board, input where we're using it to digitize 
Okay, let, let's PMT let's start this over. The, let's start over here. And this is so, Professor Ray O'Neill. So basically, and we've posted we all of our video uh, videos of all of our tests of our, of our electronics on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Using it to so if you go to YouTube and you search APCR DRDL, uh, you can check out our tests and right. you can make comments about, hey, you're doing that wrong. <laughs> you know, you might want to do it this way. Uh, or I don't understand how this electronics anyway, works. What, what's going on here? The yellow line on the screen um, is the signal from... Whoops. Hello, and this, this is, is Michael Frank. We can I'm see uh, the correct process of Sorry about digitizing. That. Okay, so I, I just included the videos because there's, uh, just to show you, so that's what, that's what a pulse actually looks like, right, uh, from the uh, detector uh, output. And here, basically, is the, uh, is the digital, is essentially the, the digital information that allows us to encode the... Um, level crossings of the pulse. So the way we, the way we uh, implement the digital, uh, the digital um, pulse processing using the FPGA is that basically the FPGA measures the time that the uh, pulse spins over various voltage thresholds. So again, the nice thing about doing this in a digital reconfigurable uh, uh, computing paradigm is that you can alter the you can alter the DAC levels, right? Uh, and then you can also, um, and so you can also uh, do the uh, pulse shape reconstruction right on the chip. Okay, so now the idea of the cosmic cube, the sort of single detector node, uh, is, a, is a commercial evolution of the cosmic eye, right? So the idea is that the cosmic cube uh, detects, it sends its information to devices, whether the device is a PC, whether the device is a tablet device or an iPhone. Uh, and in the cloud exists uh, analysis software and other data services for, for analyzing the data. Right? However, all of the detection data just e exists on the uh, PC nodes in a peer-to-peer in a -peer like network. I, I was at another talk here and somebody claimed that peer-to-peer -peer was going away. And, I don't know if that's the case, but maybe the, the whole model for this doesn't make any sense if that's, uh, if that's the case. Okay, so the Cosmic Cube features uh, wireless standard data streaming to devices uh, or the cloud. Uh, it is the GPS standard enabled, so each radiation det uh, detection event is time and location stamped. Uh, the, the electronics that we already developed for Cosmic Eye would be sort of, there'd be a version developed for the cube uh, for real-time analysis, uh, which would include some radiation species discrimination. Um, and the community of users, right? The idea, again, another plus of basing the uh, digitization of the signal pulses on reconfigurable computing is to allow the users the ability to go into the FPGA and alter the gelware, right, the, the hardware software definition uh, to their interest or to their liking. Uh, and so the idea is to allow the crowd, right, to determine um, the best way to look for uh, various kinds of cosmic ray signals, right? So now, what's the price target for something like this? So if you look at the high-end uh, Pro-Am telescopes, optical telescopes, they can uh, cost up as much as $20,000 or more, primarily due to the optics, right? Um, uh, we, have a, we have a new telescope at the university that hasn't been installed in the observatory yet, but um, the vendor basically had the, the mirror uh, atomically milled in Russia, right? at a facility that had been, um, uh, after the end of the Cold War, right, this, uh, this Russian uh, facility had to find a use for itself. And, you know, you guys may have heard the stories of, uh, you know, Russian factories that were spitting out uh, tanks and uh, airplanes and, and fighter craft uh, are now making, like, pressure cookers out of titanium. Uh, and, uh, you know, this particular facility had to find a use for its uh, atomic milling uh, and so now it's under contract, right? You can just pay them to uh, atomically mill an optical surface to, uh, to um, uh, angstrom, sub-angstrom uh, figure error resolution. 
Flat panel TVs, PCs, right, $2,000 or less. It's all based on commodity electronics. The Cosmic Cube has some, will have some optics and some electro optics, but, but mostly commodity electronics and some special materials. For instance, um, if you're going to do, um, if you're going to determine the difference between electrons and nucleons, right, the easiest way to do that is through calorimetry, where you force the, um, where you force uh, the gamma rays uh, or the electrons in the electromagnetic part of a shower uh, to convert in lead or depleted uranium. Now, I don't think we're going to get a pass from the FDA on putting depleted uranium in a consumer device. Uh, but we might be able to put lead in it as long as the lead is fully encased uh, in a uh, epoxy, in some kind of epoxy, so that it's sealed, right? It's fully sealed. Uh, but we'll have to see. All right, so who would, want to, who would want a cosmic cube, right? So we think the same people that, you know, are already into amateur astronomy uh, and are science and technology enthusiasts, folks in this crowd, for instance, might want one um, uh, because, you know, uh, Possibly contributing to science is an exciting thing. Uh, and there's some precedent for this in astronomy, particularly in astronomy, for so-called amateurs, right? I mean, this guy was an amateur, right? Darwin. It could be even argued that Einstein was an amateur when he developed the theory of relativity. And David Levy, right, of Levy Shoemaker 9 that discovered the uh, comet that slammed into Jupiter. He's an amateur. He's not a professional astronomer. Uh, uh, this fellow, whose name I, I forget, uh, Tunney, uh, I don't remember his last name, uh, forgive me, but um, uh, he's not a professional astronomer, and he's discovered two exoplanets, right? Uh, so he was one of the early discoverers, professional or amateur, of planets orbiting other stars. Um, so there's a great tradition, right, in astronomy. It's, 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 there seems to me no reason why uh, this can't be true in particle astronomy once the technology is made available to, uh, to users. Okay, so in the development of the Cosmic Cube, basically what would you get? You would basically get uh, a box, right, which contains the detector material volume, um, the, uh, uh, the, and then the, the electronics box, right, which contains the front-end digitization module, FPGA-based, some power electronics, uh, which you either could plug into the wall or you could power by solar if you wanted to put your module outside. Um, and there's useful science in, in putting the module outside versus inside. For instance, if you put your module outside, uh, then you're going to be seeing uh, more of the electrons in the shower, where uh, as you put your module inside, uh, then you're pretty much only going to see the muon component of the shower because the electrons will be absorbed by the building structure. Um, and then, of course, GPS. And so the software, uh, all based on open source, and the, at least the uh, software allowing you to alter the functionality of the FPGA would be available to you as well. Right? The only thing you would not be able to open is the detector material volume, the box which actually contains the stuff uh, which the particles in the shower convert to, that converts the particles and the energy of the particles in the shower to light. Right? particularly if that's going to contain lead or depleted uranium. Okay, for the duplication of the front-end electronics, we're looking at uh, you know, various companies that will do this cheaply, like Sunstone. Um, uh, we're open to suggestion on this as to the best way to pursue this, whether the uh, electronics development uh, duplication should be done in an open source mode at the hardware level, or at what, at what level uh, open source uh, should be in the hardware, at least in part of the hardware. I don't think we, we really don't have a good idea uh, as to how to do that. Uh, we've started a, um, a Cosmic Cube project page in Facebook. Uh, I know that there have been some other, um, some other social media um, directions talked about at this conference that are anti-Facebook. We we're open to putting a Cosmic Cube project on such as well, uh, if Facebook is sort of dying, we don't want to. We don't want to sort of uh, solicit, uh, uh, ask for participation on a dying platform. But we also have a survey, uh, which uh, is trying to gauge the interest of the public in uh, participating in particle astronomy, 
Uh, and uh, we would like you to go to the survey and fill out the survey if you have a chance. Uh, none of the questions are, um, it's a Google Documents, it's a survey created in Google Documents. It's, none of the questions are required, right? You're not required to answer any of the questions of the survey, but we would like to at least know what the, at least try to gauge the, the general interest uh, in participating in something like this is. So there's the web page, the URL for the website y.ly slash bp8. Okay, uh, now the, the sort of the, the IT addendum to the talk. So I'm, I'm a physicist, I'm not an, a computer scientist, so you, you guys know more about this than I do. Um, and and f uh, forgive me if I, if I relate anything insultingly obvious <laughs> to you. Um, but the other possibility, let's say you're, you're not interested in just using the box, the cosmic cube, as an astronomy device. What else could you potentially use it for? Well, you could use it to generate random bits for cryptography, for instance. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the entire network right, of users uh, of these things could form a, uh, an encryption network, right? a, a key generation network or a random bit generation network of true randoms. Am I, um, okay. I've got two minutes left. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, so, so there are a number of uh, random features of cosmic ray detection events, right, that you might use to generate random bits. So for instance, you could use the, uh, the, the actual time at which the first threshold, first voltage threshold is crossed by the pulse uh, during a detection event, or the, the calculated pulse centroid time, right, which is obviously related to the first voltage crossing time. The counts per bin, as long as you create the right bin, right, the counts per temporal bin in observing cosmic ray events during the day, during the week, the month, years, um, should be random. Uh, the I-fold or J-fold coincidences, if you happen to operate uh, a number of detectors, right, all tied into a single electronics box, because you want your own mini telescope um, to do triangulation on source direction, uh, then the, the pulses that are not coincidence pulses versus the pulses that are coincidence of a certain number of coincidences should also be random, right? And you can think of an, a number of other uh, things to pull that you can pull out of the data that would, be, that would be random, that might be usable for key generation, for cryptographic key generation. Okay, so uh, the, the detector network would essentially create a network random number generator, uh, and uh, you could uh, randomly sample, there could be software tools made by the community of users to randomly sample data uh, in the network nodes to provide a, another layer of randomness, right? Uh, and that could be used for cryptographic key generation uh, following the, um, uh, the recommendations, such as the recommendations made last year by NIST. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm just gonna give a shout out to the funding that we've had, but the funding is going away. <laughs> right, uh, Intel and uh, Altera, the, our license, so we're thinking about going to Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or Rocket Hub, and of course, we have a Bitcoin address. Uh, so if you are inclined to support us, to participate and support us, uh, you can Bitcoin us at, uh, at that Bitcoin address. Uh, you can also um, uh, contact me uh, at that address. I'll leave the, bit, the, uh, the Bitcoin address up. Uh, It'll come back up in a second. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the uh, the um, uh, the Hope Committee for allowing me to uh, to share this uh, this project with you. <laughs>